Hello and welcome back. In this video, I will show you some amazing historical places that I loved about Tallahassee. So we drove from Jacksonville, which is around 164 miles away, and headed to the Goodwood Museum and Gardens. Resting between two rivers, the landscape here has always been fertile. In 1825, the United States granted the Marquise de Lafayette 36 square miles in middle Florida for his help during the American Revolution. Lafayette never visited this land, and over the years it was sold to several ambitious planters. The Crooms family owned it for 20 years, but they sadly died in a shipwreck. The land and enslaved people were sold to a merchant, Mr. Hopkins from New York. He grew the property to 8,000 acres and enslaved 200 people. Little is known about the lives of these enslaved people. Goodwood was then sold to Fanny. She was a very wealthy Northeasterner. She renovated the estate and transformed it into a landscape of leisure. The Goodwood was then sold to Senator William Hodges and his wife, Margaret. After Senator Hodges died in 1940, Margaret remarried Thomas M. Hood, an army officer who had rented one of the property's guest cottages. Margaret died in 1978, and Hood restored Goodwood to look as it did when his wife first saw the property. Hood wanted the property to become a museum and green space to serve the Tallahassee community. To take a historic tour of the facility, which I personally recommend, be sure to arrive on or before 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. or in the afternoon at 1 p.m. or 2.30 p.m. on Tuesdays through Fridays. Or if you want to go on Saturday, make sure you arrive at 11.30 a.m. or 1 p.m. for their wonderful historic house tours. So this is the main visitor center. As soon as you come in, you will be assisted once you get here. Like this mirror here. Almost every item has a story, and the tour guides are very, very knowledgeable. They can answer any question you have about these artifacts and these pieces from other parts of the world. I found it thrilling to hear about stories of love, theft, war, and travels that parallel Indiana Jones himself. As you enter the main house, please keep in mind that photography is not allowed, so you will have to listen intently to the stories. Their guides are highly trained and you will definitely be in for an entertaining guided tour of this wonderful historic place. After your tour, there's plenty of green space and beautiful gardens to walk around at your own leisure. So I recommend doing that. Make sure you have enough time. The tours themselves can run from an hour and a half to, thir to two hours, depending on how many you know, questions you ask and how willing your guide is to answer those questions. We got a fantastic private tour and one of our guides has been at Goodwood for 22 years. She met one of the original workers at Goodwood and was able to preserve history before that worker passed away six years ago. I have to say I was very impressed with how knowledgeable our guides were. I would ask lots of questions about pieces of furniture, art, or clothing pieces, and they pretty much knew the answer to all of my inquiries. The tour ends in the old kitchen, where you will see future blueprints for a memorial site for the 200 enslaved people who really made Goodwood what it is today. Those blueprints reveal a bridge under the stars. The stars will be represented by beautiful lanterns hung from the trees. So it's definitely something that I look forward to visiting in the future. So if you find yourself in Tallahassee, I definitely recommend checking out the Goodwood Museum and Gardens. Check out their website for more information. Their cottages are actually for rent by the hour, so you can rent them for your business or club. They also host weddings and photography events. So when we were there, we saw they were setting up for a wedding that was going to start at 5 p.m. later that day, and we left around 2.33. If you want to visit Goodwood but don't want to do the tour, you can visit the garden and see the main house from the outside at absolutely no cost. After we walked around the garden area, we headed to our next destination, which was the Florida Capitol. The Florida Capitol complex, which is the taller building in the back, 
is home to Florida's executive and legislative branches. It is located in downtown Tallahassee. It is a 22-story building. It's open to the public Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 p.m., and it's closed on holidays. The building in front of it, however, is open on the weekends, and it acts as a museum for visitors to learn about of Florida's history. Tallahassee became the capital in 1824 as it was midway between Pensacola and St. Augustine. As Florida moved toward statehood, the need of a government grew. On March 3, 1839, Congress appropriated $20,000 for the erection of the new capital. Florida's population continued to grow and its need for government services in 1972, legislator authorized money for a new capital complex, along with a 22-story executive office building completed in 1977. The old capital building was in favor to be demolished in 1978, but luckily it was saved and refurbished and now it is open to the public. And you can learn lots on this self-guided tour. For example, this is a carpet bag, which is what the Southerners would call the Northerners carpet baggers who were looking for economic opportunity in the South post-Civil War, as they would pack all of their things in a carpet bag like this one. So this portrait was created in the early 1900s, and it is a replica of the original as this is a self-guided tour, it is entirely up to you to determine how long you want to stay here, how much you want to read, and how many of the videos you want to watch. Since we were pressed for time, we decided just to visit the main parts of this um, tour, and we decided to see the governor's suites. So here you can see the secretary's office, and as you make your way down, you can see the governor's um, office or his actual uh, room that was dedicated just for him and again keep in mind this was in the original um, capitol building not the refurbished one not the the recreated one from the 1970s and as you're looking at the government the governor's suite it definitely seems like you're looking through a window of the past that allows you to spy on what things would have looked like when the governor was there Okay, and they, do, they did save some of the original brick, so you can kind of see some of that, and then make your way up to the second floor, and there you will find Florida's House of Representatives. If you plan on visiting the 1902 restoration of the Capitol Museum, make sure you arrive 9 to 4.30 Mondays through Fridays, 10 to 4.30 on Saturdays, or 12 to 4.30 on Sundays. Now, let's head to the last part of our tour, Lake Jackson Mounds Archaeological State Park. Admission is $3 per vehicle, and the hours are from 8 a.m. until sunset, 365 days a year. The Lake Jackson Archaeological Site is the largest known ceremonial complex of the Fort Walton period in North Florida, which dates back to 1000 to 1450 A.D. The number and size of the Lake Jackson Mounds indicate that this site served as the regional chiefdom of the Mississippian culture. The entire complex was composed of seven earthen temple mounds that were part of the village and trading area. Pottery, stone tools, location, and shape of the existing mounds have been used to identify the age and culture of the site. There is evidence that the Lake Jackson Native Americans participated in the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex, a broad regional similarity of artifacts, iconography, ceremonies, and mythology of the Fort Walton period. The remains of important tribal members and high-status burials have been found at the site. Burial goods found here suggest trade with other Mississippian sites such as Etowah, Spiro, and Moundville. The presence or absence of exotic copper in a burial would be a designation of status. As you enter the mounds to the left, you will find a map that will guide you around your visit to the park. Keep in mind that most of the mounds are not accessible to the public. The two intact available for viewing by the public are situated in an open area that would have been used as a central plaza. The mound complex was composed of the seven mounds surrounded by scattered hamlets and farmsteads. 
Six mounds in the complex form two paired east to west rows are oriented towards the cardinal points. The largest mound is 278 feet by 312 feet at the base and approximately 36 feet in height. When you're here, be sure to check out some of the hikes, including an interpretive trail that passes remnants of Florida's territorial period and early statehood from 1825 to 1860. It's interesting to think that the land was part of a large plantation and grist mill owned by Colonel Robert Butler, the nephew-in-law of Andrew Jackson and the first surveyor general of Florida. The old orchard trail system winds through forested hills where giant trees from a pecan orchard can still be found. Picnic tables are available within view of the two largest mounds. A pavilion is available for family gatherings and other special occasions. Guided tours are available upon request. On your visit here, you may encounter deer, squirrels, turtles, and a variety of bird species, including osprey, red-shouldered hawks, northern cardinals, ruby-throated hummingbirds, and summer tanagers. And I personally like the look and feel of this state park because it seemed like it was untouched by man. It seemed like they had really done a good job preserving the history of what the site would have looked like back when the Native Americans inhabited it. When we got to the top, it started pouring rain and it was just a really fun moment where we got stuck for, away from the car and we were forced to interact with beautiful nature and history. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.